So uh, my name is Rob, and uh, I want to apologize about the, the font. I think uh, whatever PDF reader this is has messed with the font a little bit, but hopefully every, every slide will be readable. Um, <clears throat> so my talk today is uh, the digital cockroach bait station. And the point is to uh, teach you the basics of how to build spam honeypots, and then also go into a little bit of information about uh, what data you can get from, uh, from spam, uh, and what information you can get, especially from headers, and some, some things maybe you don't, uh, uh, that are not obvious that you can, you can gain by uh, an analyzing headers. So uh, who am I? Uh, I work for Threat Connect, and this is a startup in uh, Virginia, uh, in near Washington, D.C. And I'm a senior threat intelligence researcher. Uh, I do malware analysis and uh, integrations and uh, just about anything that needs to be done. And this is my uh, Twitter handle down here, so uh, follow me on Twitter when you have a chance. So what are the problems here? Uh, the main problem is that you need to have more uh, fresh malware samples. Uh, you need to have uh, you know, uh, fresh malicious links, uh, fresh advanced fee fraud, if that's uh, the type of, uh, of, of threat that you are uh, working on. Um, and so the, the goal here is to take from all of these uh, you know, different uh, types of attacks, phishing attacks, uh, malware attacks, gaining uh, actionable threat intelligence, and gaining context around what this particular attack that you're looking at uh, is. Like, what is probably the purpose of the attack, uh, who the adversary behind the attack is, which sometimes is uh, difficult to determine. Uh, but all the, the ultimate goal is to give you uh, information about whether to pay more attention to this particular attack if you have one of your employees that has uh, clicked a link. Is this something that you need to focus more attention on uh, and do damage control, or is this something that's just uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, unwanted program which you could just uh, you know, reformat their machine and then move on? It's not something, you know, not Chinese ABT, or it's not uh, you know, some sort of malware uh, uh, strain. So uh, I'm going to kind of use two terms interchangeably. Uh, I think they're basically the same thing, so a spam trap and a spam honeypot. Uh, I will just use these terms interchangeably. But the idea of a spam trap uh, is a little bit older and has been around for years and years and years. But the idea of a spam trap was more to collect spam on your mail server and then you know, at the same time block just to be able to block the spam. But the purpose of what I'm talking about here is sort of another advanced stage of this type of uh, honeypot where what you want to do is gather uh, data out of it about uh, you know, malware binaries, malicious links, uh, different types of attachments, etc. So this is the definition that I have of uh, spam traps. This is from Wikipedia. So spam traps are usually email addresses that are created not for communication, but rather to lure spam. So my concept of a spam honeypot still fits within this uh, older definition of uh, spam trap. But the purpose is much more advanced than just simply blocking the spam itself. <clears throat> so. Uh, I kind of, you know, I want to relate this a little bit because I have a, I have a background in biology, and so I like to kind of, you know, uh, bring a little bit of biology into this and, and think of the adversaries that I'm uh, working against as uh, cockroaches. But not all of these are cockroach traps. So each one of these is a type of insect trap, and uh, this one. You may recognize that one is a pretty traditional uh, cockroach trap. Uh, but this one, this is actually for catching flies, like Drosophila flies, or very small flies. Uh, this, is a general, this is a general trap for most types of insects. Uh, and then this is another type of uh, cockroach trap. This one is, uh, in, in my opinion, absolutely disgusting, because it has uh, what's called uh, roach butter 
on it. And so they eat the roach butter and they take it back. It has poison in it. They take it back to their colony and then they, you know, the ones that are around that roach also die. And then this one is uh, probably the most advanced of all of these traps. This one is uh, for bed bugs. <laughs> And the way it works, it has a CO2 cartridge, and bed bugs actually are attracted to your breath. That's how they find you at night. So, but moving on from entomology, we'll move back to spam. <laughs> so, I always want to make everything that I work on very, very, very simple. I don't want to spend time uh, maintaining a large system that is complex. I want to make something that is very, very simple. And I want to reuse open source software that has already been written and is solid and, and trusted. So uh, you can choose whatever mail server you like to use, uh, but I prefer using uh, Postfix. Uh, I would not recommend uh, using something like SendMail if, unless you want to have a SendMail honeypot with, uh, with the spam honeypot on top of it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you use something like Postfix, and then what you do is you have a Python script, and I will go into the details of the Python script. You run the Python script so that every single email that's sent to this mail server is parsed and has all of the headers uh, converted into JSON, and then any of the attachments and any of uh, the links that are in the body uh, are parsed out of it, and then all of this ends up uh, being inserted into an elastic search index. Uh, and this way, you're able to do correlation among different IP addresses as senders. Uh, and you, you can also you know, you can make pretty graphs as well. So uh, I want, uh, the red doesn't show up very well on these slides. I apologize. But so uh, up here, this is Postfix. So if you're not familiar with Postfix, it's a general uh, generalist mail server software, uh, very solid, uh, uh, fairly secure. Uh, and <clears throat> I personally uh, recommend running it on FreeBSD or OpenBSD, something where you don't have to worry too much about the operating system also being part of your honeypot. <laughs> uh, so JSON, if you're not familiar with JSON, uh, it's JavaScript object, no object notation. And I personally prefer JSON over XML and over YAML and the other uh, different markup languages, uh, simply because it both, it, obviously it's machine readable, but if you, if you print it well with nice spacing, human beings can also read it. So you can read the data, you can, you can read the data that's in that interchange format. But XML, I just, I, I can't read XML. It's almost illegible because it's, it's too busy. Um, <clears throat> and then Elasticsearch, uh, you know, it's up to you. If you want to use a different type of, uh, of database to store your data, that's up to you. Uh, there's MongoDB, there's other types of NoSQL. But I prefer uh, Elasticsearch simply because it's uh, very, very, very easy. Very easy to set up. It's very easy to use. And all of the, all of the text searching and, and access to uh, Elasticsearch is via RESTful APIs. So it's, uh, it, it goes over uh, the same protocols as, as all the REST APIs. Um, <clears throat> so the mail server configuration, again, uh, you know, we're going for simple. You want to accept all email from any domain, even if the domain that you have that's pointing to this particular server uh, is a different domain. If someone is going to send you spam, you don't want to reject it for any reason, even if it's for the wrong domain, wrong, you know, wrong sender, anything. So you want to accept all usernames, and you want to accept any domains. But one thing that's very important is that you want to prevent having a bounce message sent back out. You don't want to run a spam honeypot and have you, you're attracting all sorts of uh, spam coming in, and you don't want to waste time sending bounce messages back to all of these probably non-existent uh, email addresses and from addresses, et cetera. Uh, and so you basically want to block all outbound mail. And essentially, uh, one of the things that I've done on my spam honeypots is on top of configuring the mail server to uh, not send uh, bounce messages or any sort of return message at all, I make sure that the host-based firewall on the VM 
blocks all outbound traffic on those certain ports so that I'm guaranteed not to make any mistakes. Even if there's like a misconfiguration, uh, I'll st uh, it still will not send something out that I don't want it to. So uh, this is just, you know, an anything at anything. That's what you want to accept. Uh, so what I do is I process all of the inbound email with a custom Python script. And just as a backup, because you know, for, for any reason, the, if your Elasticsearch uh, cluster is uh, unreachable and you can't send your data there, you want to have another copy of it because you, know, you might miss one thing that's very important. So you want to make sure that you keep a local copy on, uh, on the mail server, on the spam honeypot, for a period of time you know, so that you can go back and, uh, and reparse your messages if something messes up in, the, in, in, your, in your storage and database. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a recommendation. And actually, if, uh, if Python is not your language, uh, you, can, you could use any language at all, because it's very, very simple, simple what I'm doing here. Uh, basically parsing each one of the header fields into key value pairs. And then say you know basically and then exporting that as uh, as a JSON file, and then the body and the uh, the body also as one you know key body, and then the value is the text of the body, and then also just as a second uh, um, you know so that there's a single uh, uh, text blob. I also save header as a key, and then the entire header not broken up, just exactly as it is in the, in the message as another uh, key value pair. So uh, I prefer Python 3.4. Uh, you know, there's certain times where I have to use Python 2, uh, but I try to move away from Python for anything new. Uh, so, and then, like I said, it translates all of the emails into JSON format and then exports them and saves them into an index in Elasticsearch. So good. This, uh, this is, this is a kind of a very busy slide, but we're going to spend a lot of time on this one because it's very important to know what data you can get from uh, spam. And I apologize if you can't read it. I'll read it out to you. But uh, so one of the important things that you can get is from the date time zone. So if you have uh, legitimate email coming from you know, Eastern Standard Time in the United States, chances are that's coming from a mail server that you, uh, you might not trust, but at least you know that it's you know, in the United States. But if you have an email uh, that's inbound and the, the time zone is, uh, I don't know, in China or in Europe, you know, you, you might actually put maybe, you know, if you have some sort of filtration, you might put a, you know, a plus one as far as like suspiciousness of this particular uh, uh, piece of email. So especially you, you can find, uh, you know, information about where that mail server or, uh, or the botnet or wherever it thinks it's sending from. Uh, you can get some small amount of information from the time zone itself. So pay attention to the time zone. Um, SPF, so these next two, uh, SPF and DKIM, uh, these are important. So D DKIM is uh, domain keys. And SPF, both SPF and DKIM are uh, methods of blocking spam. So they, uh, they're a way to verify whether the sender of this particular email is who they say they are and is coming from the domain that they say they're coming from. Uh, so in this case, it's good to, it's good to find uh, this information. You can find the forged, you can find forged DKIM keys. Uh, also, the SPF, if you see uh, SPF fail, pay more attention to that particular uh, uh, piece of spam. So another thing, this is, uh, this is something that is a little bit, uh, that might not be as obvious as the other components here. So the e E-H-L-O or H-E-L-O string, this is uh, during the uh, SMTP handshake uh, when, you know, when one mail server or a mail client is speaking to a mail server, it makes a connection on port 25, and then it goes through uh, an SMTP handshake. So the first thing it does is it says hello or E-H-L-O, and then it says uh, who its domain is supposed to be. 
So if, for example, uh, you know, I am a male client and I'm telling the truth, I'm not like a misconfigured male client, I'm not doing anything malicious, uh, what I would do is if, if my male client is configured to be at, uh, you know, uh, rob at example.com, ELHO would say ELHO example.com, the, the domain that I'm telling the mail server that I'm coming from. So this one is actually interesting because let's say that you have a particular botnet which is sending out you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of spam. There's only two things that it can do. It's not going to tell the truth, so it's not going to, you know, it's not going to give you its true domain because it's a botnet, it doesn't actually have a, a specific domain, but there's two things it can do. It will have either uh, similar to a domain generation algorithm, like the ones that you see for uh, uh, botnet C2, where they call back to a, a domain generation algorithm. So it'll have a similar type of algorithm, just generating random or um, semi-random domains, or it will just be configured to say the same thing over and over, the same like hard-coded uh, uh, ELHO string. So you can key off of that, and you can, for some types of botnet, you can identify uh, that particular uh, uh, operator of the botnet because of the way that they've configured it. And so this is actually an indicator of that particular uh, type uh, of delivery method. So that one is pretty interesting. Uh, also, obviously, uh, the originating IP. Originating IP is not always the source uh, you could have open relays. You can have, uh, sometimes you even have a mail, uh, uh, sorry, a web server, and the web server is compromised, and the web server is actually sending out uh, spam or relaying spam from botnet uh, via, P like a PHP, uh, similar to a PHP backdoor, but a PHP-based mailer. Um, if you do, uh, if, if, you're, if you maintain websites and you have like a, a, a compromised WordPress site, you've probably seen this type of mailer before. Um, so what you can get from uh, the originating IP, obviously you can get network who is, uh, geo IP, ASN who is, uh, and then also this is one that, is, uh, that, that some people don't pay too close attention to, but there's R who is. So an ISP will reassign a block of IP addresses to maybe a hosting provider, and so the hosting provider's information is found in uh, the R who is data. So if you need to contact someone to report abuse, uh, often you can get the, the, the more specific information from R who is. Uh, so the next one, reply to. So reply to is interesting for certain types of scams that you would see in, um, in spam. So for, uh, specifically, these are uh, important very important in uh, advanced fee fraud. So these are the sorts of things where, you know, the Nigerian prince is sending you uh, $1 million as long as you send the Nigerian prince uh, $100 now. Uh, this sort of thing, uh, that type of adversary needs to receive your reply so they don't forge the information here in reply to. This is usually a live address, uh, and so you can use that as an indicator. Uh, if you're collecting a set of uh, threat intelligence. So this can be an indicator that you want to, to, to uh, save. And also you can correlate across different attacks and follow patterns because uh, adversaries typically use their same, you know, same set of email addresses or same style of email addresses over and over and over. <clears throat> Uh, the subject, subject's interesting. Um, the subject is, is interesting in certain ways, but, uh, you know, when I get down here to this, when I talk about the SIM hash, uh, the, that's where the subject will become more important. But the subject by itself is, uh, in, until we get down here and I explain this, the subject is not necessarily that important at this point. Uh, fr the from address, this is typically forged. Uh, you know, you, during the SMTP handshake, you can type, as long as, you're, as, long as that uh, mail server that you're sending the spam to is maybe misconfigured or not configured very strictly, uh, the from address can just be anything, anything you want. You can just type in whatever you want. Um, so the from address 
not necessarily something that you wanted to keep as, uh, as a specific indicator of a live email address that you may want to track, but it can be, it can be used to correlate across different, uh, different attacks. You can also um, see, you'll, you'll even see if someone is trying to attack your company, you might even see the from address being an email address at your company. <laughs> so. Then uh, envelope sender, this is a little bit different than the from address. This is, so when, when you have an SMTP session uh, and the connection goes through the ELHO at the beginning and then it says uh, receipt to and mail from, so the mail from, the email address that is put into mail from is found here in the envelope sender. So this, is, this can be forged also, but it's actually a diff it can even be a c completely different address than the from, because from is actually uh, when, you, when you go past the, the mail from and the receipt to, uh, the next step you, you enter data, and so the from, the from address is actually part of the data uh, section of an SMTP uh, uh, connection. So, <clears throat> Uh, let, so return path, this is not, not necessarily that important for me in this stuff, but this part, so X mailer and the uh, mail URL, this is very, very, very interesting. So when you have a compromised website and the compromised website is being used uh, to send spam, uh, one of two things can happen. One is the, uh, the PHP mailer that's being used that has been inserted into the, the compromised website as being used to relay the spam. Uh, if the spammer doesn't configure it properly, it will actually record its own path on that mail server in this uh, X mailer uh, field in the header. So. Uh, if you want to do some sort of takedown on that particular, uh, you know, uh, 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 spam source, you can actually figure out exactly the file on the server that is that has been inserted into the server. So you can call the you know hosting company or the website owner and say, you know, hey, uh, not only take this file off, clean up your stuff, but also can you send me a copy of this file? I want to see like what the configuration is inside, you know, what the the PHP code is for it. So the next part down here, this is another uh, not so obvious uh, but very interesting uh, uh, header component. So the MIME boundary string, the MIME boundary string, when you have uh, different types of data in the body of an email, uh, they will have a MIME boundary string around them, unless the email is just plain text. If it's plain text, there won't be any MIME boundary strings. But if you have HTML or if you have an attachment, uh, you'll have a MIME boundary string uh, on both sides of that uh, different type of data. And if you look, the MIME boundary string is typically uh, you know, an, a random or semi-random string of characters. But again, because that is, you know, uh, you have a botnet and the botnet is just generating spam, Chances are that botnet that's generating the spam is not using, uh, you know, clean, good uh, email client code that's going to generate a normal, you know, uh, 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 a regular uh, MIME boundary string. It's going to generate either the same MIME boundary string over and over for a lot of emails, uh, or it will use one that has a certain uh, pattern. And so this becomes its own indicator of the origin of that pr particular piece of spam. Um, <clears throat> okay, now we get down to simhash. So this is, uh, this is something that, I that I'm working on right now. I'm, it's uh, still, in the, still in sort of the, uh, uh, I guess, theoretical area. Uh, but simhash is one of the two, uh, I know of two algorithms that do piecewise fuzzy hashing. So piecewise fuzzy hashing is something that's used extensively in malware research. And what it is, you take, uh, you know, uh, you take a, a blob of data and you break it up into certain known pieces and then you take hashes of the pieces. And then when you have two, let's say, two files that have had a piecewise fuzzy hash, uh, you can compare them and see how different they are from each other. And if, you know, one part of it is, is slightly different, but then this whole area is the same, uh, you know, the distance between those two files will be very close. 
So uh, there's two there's two different uh, two different uh, types of piecewise fuzzy hashing that I'm aware of. One is called sim hash, and sim hash is actually a algorithm which is targeted towards text. So it's uh, it's efficient for looking at two pieces of text and seeing how different or how or how similar they are. Uh, and then the other type uh, is called S, uh, SSDeep. And if you do malware research, you've probably heard of SSDeep. It's more, uh, it's more tuned for looking at the difference between two uh, binary files, right? So uh, the thing, that I'm, the thing that, that I'm working on is to take a sim hash of certain header uh, fields, such as the from address, uh, such as the, the subject, uh, reply to things that are going to be indicators, uh, you know, things that are going to be indicators of possibly, you know, the the origin of this uh, of the spam, and then take a sim hash of each one each one of these, and you know, in theory, I should be able to get uh, a, basically a distance and a similarity between one email and another email, and see, uh, you know, in and be able to use that in an automated way. If I have this uh, particular, you know. Uh, don't open the, or please open this fax, uh, you know, and has an attachment. If the if the set of header fields uh, after I've run it through sim hash is close enough, I can also say, hey, this other email that's not necessarily asking about a, uh, a fax might be closely related to this one because of some of the similarities in the header. So I can, you know. Uh, Perhaps use this to block it on a mail server, um, or just do it to uh, to, to find you know uh, nexuses of uh, different uh, um, uh, attacks. So that's a, that's uh, that's it for the header. Uh, and then this is over here. This is uh, this is all of the information. Uh, not all of the information, but these are some of the major uh, components and information that you can get from the body of the email. So uh, again. The advanced fee fraud attacks use uh, phone numbers embedded in the email. Uh, that's one of the ways that they get you to contact them. Uh, from, from my experience, a lot of these are VoIP numbers that are pointing to another number uh, so that when they get taken down, they can just roll it to the next one. Uh, the next most uh, prevalent from that is probably cell phones. Uh, but most of the time, it's, uh, I see uh, VoIP numbers in here. Uh, and then, of course, the attachment. Uh, the attachment can be uh, either, you know, it could be any number of things, uh, and maybe a, a, a Base64 encoded HTML. Uh, it could have a job. It could have a JavaScript uh, um, attack buried in the attachment. It could be a binary. It could be any number of things. Uh, also, you can get a URL uh, if you've got a drive-by attack, or if you just have like a regular download. Some, you know. Uh, I've seen many, 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 many malware attacks where the, 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 the uh, URL is just a file. Click and download the file, and then it said, you know, it, the instructions in the email are please run this or please open this. Uh, and it, uh, sometimes the file will be like uh, jpeg.exe or, <laughs> or uh, pdf.exe or something like this. Uh, and it works. I mean, it <laughs> it's amazing. It still works, but it does work. Uh, and then I, down here, uh, I have listed two, two types of sim hash that I take of the body. And the reason for this, uh, I just call this a rendered sim hash. And the reason for this is some emails will have uh, plain text. And then in another, uh, between another mime boundary, they'll have an HTML with like all the pretty graphics and fonts and all that crap. So, what I want to do is not necessarily take a sim hash that includes all of the HTML. So what I use is uh, Beautiful Soup. You can use any type, any type of uh, scraper or software, but I use Beautiful Soup to just remove all of the HTML tags. And then after I've removed all of the HTML tags, then I take a sim hash of the remaining, uh, the remaining data. And then obviously you can get an email address uh, and then the text of the, of the body. So this is just an overview of uh, some of the different things that you can get from uh, an email. And you know, uh, I already talked about Elasticsearch. So now this is the, this is the part where you, oh, all right, I'm sorry. These, these, were, these were actually cockroaches, and those were bed bugs. But 
I guess the, the, uh, the, the, the picture didn't come through on this laptop. I apologize. Um, but this is where you want to, uh, first of all, register a domain. Uh, another option is to go and look. There's, uh, you know, there's many, many, many domain squatting sites that want to sell you old domains. So you can, some of them, you can rank the domain by its age. And so who cares what the domain is? I want a domain that's been out there for 20 years, just existing for 20 years, because there's, it will attract more spam than others. Uh, but uh, one thing that's important, after you, after you have uh, registered your domain, make sure if you're going to register it, uh, make sure to turn on domain privacy or whatever uh, thing uh, that particular uh, 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 registrar provides, or just put fake information in there. Most of them won't cancel your domain for a year until uh, someone complains about it. <laughs> um, now, the next step is to configure your DNS. Uh, there's a couple of nuances here for configuring your DNS. It's very important uh, to make sure that you don't net have only one IP address because you're trying to simulate a real uh, mail server in a real mail environment in a real enterprise in a company. So no company just has one, one IP address for their mail server. They have a set of IP addresses for their mail server referring to different ones. So make sure you assign at least three IP addresses you, you can pretend, because the, the, the mail server, you, can only, you only have to set up one spam honeypot, one, sp one mail server for this, but assign three, three different IP addresses at least to that server uh, so that you simulate a real environment. Uh, also create a primary and two backup host names, so have all of them, uh, you know, mail1.example.com, uh, mail mail2.example.com, and mail3, et cetera. Also simulating a real mail environment uh, uh, so that it looks right. Now, this last one, this is actually the one that's very nuanced. So you want to have three or more uh, DNS MX records, and you want to have differing priorities set to those MX records. We're going to look at a slide in a minute uh, that shows this. But the reason for this is sometimes the main, uh, your primary mail server is where you have things like antivirus or some sort of, uh, or you're running uh, spam filters. And the protection that you have is on, the, on your primary mail server. Your secondary mail server or your tertiary mail server sometimes will have no spam filtration, no AV. And so I've seen a lot of spammers will send only to the higher uh, priority MX records. And they will uh, sp they'll specifically, on purpose, not send to your uh, primary mail server because they're hoping that the, the primary mail server trusts mail that's coming from the secondary, and the secondary has no spam protection on it. So make sure you have three uh, DNS MX records so that you catch, you catch that extra spam and you catch those other people that are targeting uh, you know, lower priority MX, MX uh, mail servers. So now you need to generate email addresses to seed them out to all of the world, send it everywhere, get it on every single list and everything. But uh, what you want to do is you can seed them on your own website, put them in, uh, you know, uh, put them in metadata, put them all over the place, give them to your friends, uh, have your friends help seed when they, you know, write a comment on some website, just have them put the, this random email address like in the bottom of their comment. You know, why not? Uh, <clears throat> but the important part here when you're seeding email addresses out is maintain either a spreadsheet or a database or something so that you know where the email address went, where you put it, uh, what date you put it there, and you know, maybe who you gave it to if someone else is going to seed it for you so that you know, all right, this place generates this type of spam. So you can correlate uh, where that email address was seeded with the type of attacks and the type of spam that come into that particular email address. All right. So when you're registering the uh, domain, sorry, this doesn't actually, it didn't, didn't wrap properly with this, uh, with this PDF reader. I apologize. But there's many free services out there for registering domains. And they will even let you uh, have email, email service on them. The adversary uses these, you know, like .tk and stuff like this. Why can't we use the same services? So 
just make sure that you protect your identity by using free email services, uh, burner, you know, basically burner emails, and uh, you know, protect yourself with domain registration, DNS service. Um, and before you begin seeding the, before you begin seeding anything out into the world and trying to collect uh, spam, look very carefully at your own Whois information. Look very carefully at your DNS records. Look at it very carefully and see if you've made a mistake and you're leaking any information about yourself. If you've left your name or if you've registered the domain and you forgot to turn on uh, Whois privacy or something like this, and you know there's some identifying information about you. You want to make sure that's not there before you begin sending stuff out to, uh, to attract adversaries. Uh, and also, this is something that's, uh, that, that's very, very important. On the spam honeypot itself, uh, there is a pretty good chance that at some point this server will get popped by someone, right? So you don't want to have the, the admin or the username that you're logging in to the spam honeypot as your, you know, your hacker handle. You don't, want it have, you don't want to have any trace of anything on there. Just call it something boring like you know, user1 and then admin1 so that there's no, there's no trace of, of anything that if someone pops your spam honeypot, they could possibly figure out like, who you are, any information about that. Um, also, with things like uh, logs, it's up to you. Uh, I, when, I, when I set up my spam honeypots, the, the uh, auth logs and uh, incoming IP address logs are all sent to dev null. So that if, if, the, if the box gets popped, uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult for someone to figure out where, where I'm coming from. Uh, so yeah, make your username uh, on the new server very generic. Oh, it didn't work. OK. so. This was a screenshot of uh, the DNS records for uh, a, a uh, example spam honeypot. I apologize, this slide doesn't work. Uh, if any, by the way, if anybody wants the slides, uh, just come tell me afterwards. Uh, I'll give you a copy of the slides. Um, I've got them here on PDF, and uh, you should be able to, if you read, if you look this, uh, look at this, uh, you know, on a different PDF reader, you should be able to see this uh, this example slide. So. Uh, now, you know, you have to sometimes have a little fun when you're doing this sort of thing. So when you're generating the email addresses, you want to generate email addresses. Some of them you might want to generate them that are just random whatever. But other, you know, other ones you might want to have something that looks real, you know, real names, uh, real names for companies and this sort of thing. So um, have fun with it. So these are just a few sites that I use uh, to generate the names. Um, so I have uh, you know behind the name random random name generator uh, name mesh, uh, and these two are these two are interesting because they make uh, they just they they uh, they spit out random generic company names. So if you want to make a domain name that's you know based on something that sounds like a real company, uh, just have have this. Make a couple of uh, random names. Another thing, uh, Scrabble Word Scrabble Word Finder. Deal. If you like Scrabble, you can increase your Scrabble knowledge at the same time as you're making uh, fake email addresses by looking through all the Scrabble Word Finders and then memorizing the words that you're using there and just creating email addresses with it. Um, and then anagram solvers. So put in a word and then find all the different anagrams for it and then create email email addresses for that. So. Now you have spam, and the sorry, this this slide also had a picture. It had a picture of probably my favorite piece of spam I've ever seen. Uh, and believe me, come come get the PDF of this. Uh, it actually has a uh, a malicious link where it ends in uh, main.php, and then it has a big ASCII like finger clicking the link. <laughs> And it, it's awesome. I apologize. This uh, the PDF reader on this machine is not not the best. Uh, but thank you. Uh, this is uh, this is the uh, uh, my company's blog where we publish research. Uh, this is my uh, Twitter handle, and then this is our uh, company Twitter handle. So please come check us out and follow me. Um, and if we have any questions. Hi. Uh, yes. What is the advantage of generating mailbox names over using a catch-all mailbox? 
What's that? What is the advantage of generating mailbox names on the honeypot over using a catch-all mailbox? So, so the question is, uh, what, is the, what is the benefit of generating a set of email addresses over just having a spam honeypot that, that catches everything? So you do want to always have a spam. The, the underlying spam honeypot is that it catches everything. But the reason why you would generate I mean, generating the random ones is not the important thing. It's that you have a specific email address that you have seeded in one specific location, so you know that if something is sent to this particular email address, you know where you seeded it, and you know uh, perhaps uh, some information about like how the how the adversary is is getting their or gathering their email addresses. You could also. Uh, you said that you log when you seeded that email address to a certain forum or whatever mm -hmm. to gather spam. Uh, you could also log that email address. It would sh still show up in the log of the catch-all email uh, address. That email that you... Uh, so I'm, I, I, now I'm not following you. Uh, if you uh, send out oh, the wait, seed... You're, you're, so, so hold on. You're saying, no, no, I, I think there might have been a misunderstanding. So I'm, when, I, when I say uh, generate email addresses, yes. all I mean is generate the text of the email oh, address. Oh, oh, oh. Nothing, on the, nothing on the server. Oh, okay. that, <laughs> yeah, the catch-all the catch will catch all of that. that when that's I'm what saying, I meant. Yeah, when yeah. I'm saying generating an email address, I'm just saying, you know, use those tools to generate a list of email addresses that you put in your spreadsheet or your database so that you can correlate that with the spam that's coming in. Yeah, that's what I meant. Thanks. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have a feeling that this is only one half of the story. right? So you have uh, built a system which, can, which is pretty elaborate. Uh, it can track uh, where you've sent the seeded addresses to, uh, what paths were used to harvest those uh, addresses. Now, what I would be interested in, uh, what mechanisms, uh, mostly legal, do you have at your uh, own di disposal to actually do something uh, about it? Basically, you are harvesting a lot of uh, big data information about spammers. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody might say, so what? What so, can you do with it? OK, so this is a good question. So one, once you've gathered your spam, uh, what can you do with it? What, what purpose do you have for gathering this? Uh, so uh, there's many different purposes here. Uh, but I'll talk about one. So specifically, if there is a a new, a new attack, and I'll actually uh, not even give, I, I will give you a specific use case. So uh, after the hack, after hacking team was popped, everybody remembers that uh, two months ago, hacking team was popped, and then uh, they had a, a, a set of flash O days uh, that were being weaponized. Uh, first, the first one that I found that weaponized it was an Angler EK, uh, and then you know, like rig exploit kit and all the other exploit kits also used it. But there was also an APT group, uh, which is known uh, by the name Weckby. So the Weckby APT group began using that particular uh, um, flash exploit weaponized from the, from the hacking team uh, disclosure. And so they began sending that out uh, just as a, you know, uh, a, a shotgun blast via spam, and that's how I caught that. So, you know, the, the way that I, you know, gathered the data to, to, to then look at the flash file, you know, uh, reverse it into action script, uh, find out what, it's, what the, the payload binary is that it's delivering, all of this, I gained that knowledge by having a spam honeypot working and, and catching that to begin with. Okay, so uh, are you also employing uh, something like uh, legal things? Uh, is it uh, something you can do in this global world? Is it uh, doable? Is, is running a spam honeypot? Let's let's change. So let let's let's change that question slightly. Instead of 
is it legal? Let's ask the question, is no, it uh, illegal? No, uh, my question not, the, was, not to my knowledge, is it illegal? So. Uh, no, my question was not about you being legal, but can, when, once you've tracked down somebody, can you take legal actions to take um, that guy so down? The, the, you How know, doable let's, is that? Let's say, so after, you know, after you've developed uh, a, uh, you know, a set of threat intelligence on a particular attack, and then uh, from that set of uh, threat intelligence, maybe over uh, quite a bit of time, you were able to perhaps uh, a, an adversary, their persona, uh, emerges from, you know, from your analysis of this data. Um, typically, I, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to do something legally against uh, that entity. They're typically in a different country than the US. Uh, however, it's still very, very important to know uh, that information so that, your, uh, so that your security team and your company can make a decision as to whether this adversary is very capable or whether they're just you know, some uh, script kitty that doesn't have a whole lot of knowledge and is not specifically targeting you. So you'd be able to divide your attacks uh, between you know, uh, uh, just typical crimeware and then something that's a targeted attack against you. And so therefore you're able to not necessarily go after that adversary or that group, but you're able to make an educated decision as to whether you need to pay more attention to what just happened on your network or if you can just use regular procedures and, and move on, you know? Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. I, I really liked it. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, have you ever thought of uh, making your honeypot as an open relay? Uh, with one option is to like limit the connections uh, which coming from outside the world to your server uh, to prevent server exhaustion and at the same time prevent uh, reflected denial of service attack. But Maybe it's a good idea to be intermediate, being one in the middle between the attacker, better than being the receiver. Okay, uh, I hadn't thought about that, but uh, uh, definitely we, we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.